Hi, this is David Levine. I'm sorry, we're a little late, a few technical difficulties. Um, thank you, Dr. Stein, for joining us. Dr. Michael Stein, um, today we'll be talking about his new book, uh, Me Versus Us, A Health Divided. It was published by an Ox Oxford University Press, September 22. Dr. Stein is a physician, a health policy researcher, and thought leader in the field of public health. He currently serves as the chair and professor of health law, policy and management at the Boston University School of Public Health. Prior to his appointment at BU, he served as professor of medicine, director of behavioral medicine and addiction research at Brown University. For the past three years, I'm sorry, for the past three decades, Dr. Stein has produced work that has spanned the topics of sleep and pain, addiction and HIV AIDS, mental health and behavioral risk-taking, healthcare access and quality. He has published more than 400 scientific journals in the public space. He has published widely in the lay press, including the Washington Post, the Boston Globe and the New York Times. He is the author of 11 books, the executive editor of Public Health Post. So, Dr. Stein, thank you for joining me. For the audience listening, I don't have a frog in my throat. I do have COVID. I was diagnosed on Monday, and I feel okay. Um, but my, was, but today was the first time that my voice started going. So, anyways, I appreciate you bearing with me, um, Dr. Stein. Um, welcome to the program. Do you have a copy of your book? I only, I only, I only have a um, PDF. I have a copy of my book somewhere. Sure. Thanks okay. for having me. Okay, great. Maybe you can sh show it to the audience. Ah, yeah. see if I can read it. Hold on. Okay. Yes, they all need to go and order this now before we take any questions. Can you see that? It's a very pretty cover. I do. Is it clear? It is. Let's see. Uh, me versus us yeah so i received this in the mail which is not as pretty as that no well we'll okay. send you this i'm happy to send it to you does it does it well it has the whole book so let's talk about the concept of me versus us first of all what is me versus us so me versus us is a sort of way of um putting at two ends of a argumentative spectrum what i've experienced in my personal life and what we have happening in this country which is i am a primary care doctor who's worked for decades seeing patients one by one in my american medical office and a number of years ago i joined a public health school i've been a researcher for years and decided to really sort of focus more on policy and the me versus us is really saying, listen, the, the, the major way that we think in America about health, if you say the word health at a bar or Thanksgiving dinner or barbecue, people immediately talk about health care. They talk about their doctors, emergency rooms, hospitals, medications, x-rays. They tell you their stories about what's happened to them personally, and they don't really think about sort of health as a broader group project. And of course, that's in keeping, right, with America, right? We're a, we're a self-help ethos country who believes in individualism and thinks of all of life as an individual journey where I succeed or fail on my own. And that sort of idea about individualism, of course, translates into the medical setting where we're all personally responsible for you know, exercising and sleeping right, and eating the right things, if we can afford those things. And it's all about us. And that's what I call the me perspective. And then the us perspective is, is, of course, public health, which says, you know, there's a group of us that you're part of a group. And not only are you part of a group, but that, you know, the people who are in that group, whether it's a small group, the people you live with, or a slightly bigger group, your neighborhood, or a slightly bigger group, you're city or state, the those people's 
lives are going to affect your lives and so beware be a be a be part of the group project that says um you know public health is important and the conditions that are established as to how you live are gonna be important in your life and like life expectancy so that's the contrast it's me versus us and it's drawn severely to bring out the point of how much the me perspective has just dominated in America, money-wise, conversation-wise. So this book is really meant to sort of start the conversation going in the other direction. Okay, um, you, you um, take quite a few pages to talk about COVID's effect on public health and in terms of get people getting protective equipment, um, in terms of the vaccines. <laughs> And it was one of the, you said, you, you found it to be a game changer in people's understanding of public health. Yeah, so I would say it a little differently. I don't know that it's a game changer in either the understanding of public health or what will happen with public health, but it was certainly the first instance in my lifetime where you heard a lot of people use the term public health. Now, do they know what public health was? Well, they know what one part of public health was, right, which was an airborne infectious disease that came in to this country and killed a million people. So at scale, they understand, I think, what public health was and could be, right? It sort of took the public health message, which is that, you know, my health is influenced by your health, right? That's the public health message. It's not just you going to the gym and sleeping well. My health influenced your health was played out you know millions of times in this in this epidemic right it, the person you're sitting next to on the bus and the person who's serving you and the person who's at the museum with you are all part of your health world and covid said that to us and we could talk lots about covid here I, I, we can go wherever you want all, all i can say is that you know for those of us who are old enough or had parents who are old enough who lived through polio right, which was another sort of scary mm -hmm. infectious disease in the last century that was, you know, took up a lot of our time. There have been obviously other infectious diseases, SARS and MERS, et cetera. Polio is a big one and and really sound, stands to my mind in sort of distinction to COVID where, you know, polio was seen as a shared national tragedy and COVID was really never seen that way. Polio was sort of a public health lens right was seen as we're all in this together and there's sort of a shared collective experience and covid was never seen that way and i think there are a bunch of reasons why many of them political and the moment that we live in but covid did tell us some things about public health most of what it told us about public health frankly is that um you know half the states in the united states pass laws restricting public health powers that's what covid tells me and it tells us something about the public health system, which I'm not sure exactly who's listening tonight, but people may know more or less about what the public health system or really systems is in the United States. So at some point we might wanna just go there and set some some framing. Okay, so I mean, when we advertise this to our audience and public, we, you know, we said that we we're gonna talk about why public health is not as exciting as you know, the technological breakthroughs like a heart and lung machine or, you know, even the vaccine against polio. Um, and, <clears throat> and public health has to really, you know, has to deal with all kinds of things that are, you know, sanitation, um, you know, you know, keeping people from um, getting, you know, getting AIDS, um, having people wash their hands, all kinds of things. I mean, hospitals have had health campaigns for doctors to wash their hands for, forever. And the rates have barely gone past 50%, uh, despite all the efforts. And, and it's, you know, it's certainly, you know, hand washing is certainly not as, for you know, want of a better word, as sexy as uh, the heart and lung machine or, the, or you know, um, you know, or any any of the you know modern breakthroughs. I mean, I I mean, the the Operation Warp Speed was a very exciting experience because um, it, it and first of all it worked 
and it resulted in a vaccine that people could get. But then there was a scramble to get it. And that was, you know, somehow we understood more about public health is that you can't always get what you want. I mean, you have to you know, get up very early in the morning, you have to have five different browsers open and trying to get a very elusive appointment. Um, and then today you can, most people, in, half the people in the United States, you know, have not even gotten a booster shot. You can just walk into a drugstore and get one. And um, it's, you know, it, it's not seen as exciting as it was. Um, so talk, talk a little bit about um, some of the successful public health measures. I mean, one, one that comes to mind is that the, the curve of cigarette smoking. Yeah, but you said so many interesting things on the way into that. I didn't know where you were going with that question. I mean, you know, uh, so let me step back to the COVID piece for a minute, but just because I thought the things you said were interesting. So, I mean, you had this miraculous scientific breakthrough, right, which was the incredibly fast mm -hmm creation of an mRNA vaccine. I mean, that was really just incredible. And I would put that on the, as you said, on the side of healthcare. I don't consider the creation of a vaccine a public health issue. That was really a sort of healthcare or medical care breakthrough. And it was fantastic. And it has saved tens of millions of lives. And, and it really is sort of mind blowing to think about that, right? So on either side of that, of course, is public health, right? So you had a year before the vaccine in the United States, where all we had were public health measures that were essentially from the middle ages, right? Stay away from people, mm -hmm. and quarantine and wear a mask. And, you know, we did just terribly at that in the United States because we're divided and there were politicians who were further dividing us during a moment when you wanted to share something and everybody was at risk. So, and of course we weren't at risk equally. That's of course the, the underlying message, right? Just like we have underlying conditions, right? That's what made people at risk for COVID. People thought underlying conditions. Well, the United States had some underlying conditions that made COVID maldistributed, right? It wasn't an equal opportunity virus. It ended up, you know, killing and infecting many more Blacks and Hispanics and poor people and essential workers and old people and prisoners and many groups that have had burdens of illness in the United States. So this was not, you would think of a pandemic as sort of this random thing. And of course, in the United States, it wasn't random. It just reflected many of the problems that we have societally in terms of inequities here. And so we have a year until we have a vaccine. And then we have this miracle of science going on in the background. And then now we have the next public health problem, which is, as you were describing, an implementation. How do you, how do you roll out 330 million vaccines at once? And how do you deliver it without, as you said, people going on browsers? And that created its own public health problem. So I think it's just the in interesting moments where you saw the sort of difficulties of, of running public health in the United States. And there's lots of history for why that is. The cigarette story is a different story. It's really a different story because it's a different duration story, right? I mean, it's a... 50 year story and that's and that's the story of public health and why it sort of drives us crazy that it's you know it's not a one year story it's not a one month story it's not a cure story it's a story that takes you know many years because it's complicated and in the end it's political and that's the story of cigarette smoking right and and that's why public health is not as sexy as you were saying as individual health because you know, the benefits are not immediate and specifically to you in public health, like they are in a heart lung machine. They are broader. And um, the cost is to you in public health, because you're often paying taxes that support government workers who supply you with public health. But the benefits are again, not immediate and specific. So cigarette smoking was a, you know, a 50 year battle against an industry that fought back as hard as it could and continues to fight back um, against sort of scientific evidence and culture and politics. And it's taken, you know, every bit of our 
political will and energy and really sort of just a slow cultural change, I think, to make use of, again, the many interventions. There was no single blow, right, that sort of changed our smoking behaviors as a country. But we moved from, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of people smoking to now 15 percent of people smoking. And and those 15 percent who are smoking combustible cigarettes are really specific groups, right? Again, specific groups. It's not diverse, right? If you look at high income people, the rate of smoking in the United States is like 1%. And when you look at low income people, the rate is like 30%. So it comes out, you know, somewhere around 15% as a country, much better. But again, took two generations, lots of interventions at lots of levels. And here's where we are. So that's the story of public health at major changes, whether it had to do with sanitation, as you said, all the big changes of the 20th century, sanitation, fluoridation, et cetera. There are long stories. We like short stories. Okay, so you write that the misplaced edu emphasis on healthcare endangers, endangers us. It puts us at risk between the solutions to our most concerning health crisis, crises, from obesity to climate change, will not come from self-concern or individual actions, but from the us perspective of public health. Yeah. And can you explain that? Yeah, it's it, and I'll, I'll continue and circle back to what I said. I, I need to persuade you as a person who doubts that statement. And this is not an easy persuasion, so I hope that you'll listen and hear, hear this out and think about it. But I need to persuade you that not to think as an individual all the time right? And only about yourself and only about your immediate interest. You, sh you, you should do that most of the time. And you're going to do that most of the time, but that there's a larger interest here. And that larger interest is going to generally be political and is going to take time to sort of play out. But that um, that's going to, in the end, be important to us as a country over time, that is your kids and grandkids will benefit by your attention to public health today. And that, you know, self-interest is, um, is, is, has not gotten us very far, right? It's, it, uh, let me put it in the most extreme terms that I can think of. Self-interest, which is I, I, the way I think most people think about health still, you know, has left us with, you know, 50% of the population obese and the Arctic melting. Like that's what self-interest has done. So clearly there are some problems with pure self-interest if our notion is we want to have better health and longer life expectancy. When I talk about health, again, I'm talking about the health of a population, not your health who can go to the gym and eat well. I'm talking about all Americans and the metric for that to me, the easiest one, the one that's most agreeable is life expectancy, right? I mean, there are others, there's infant mortality, et cetera. And so, but let's start with life expectancy. It's really the same as infant mortality, which is that, you know, we're as a country 40th in the world at life expectancy. So the great American exceptionalism has placed us at this point 40th in the world in terms of life expectancy, including, you know, downward life expectancy in the last three years, the first time that's happened ever in American history. Uh, so that's not good. We're not in a good place. So if we want to change public health, i.e. life expectancy, this is the conversation I think we have. So so what does that mean when you have a bad life expectancy and when did that happen is sort of the interesting question, right? So if you look at life expectancy, comparing us to other high life expectancy developed countries like Europe. In 1990, we were pretty much dead on with Europe life expectancy. And that means in the last 30 years, we have completely fallen off the map. We were, you know, fifth, seventh, 10th in the world in life expectancy back then. Now we're 40th 
So what's happened to us in 30 years? What what has happened to us that, you know, American babies are more likely to die before they turn five and uh, American teenagers are more likely to die before 20 and American adults are more likely to turn 65 than their counterparts in essentially any country in Europe? Like, why has Europe have better life outcomes than the United States across the board, white, black, high poverty, low poverty, we've been blown out of the water in 30 years. That's the question that if you know, you're a serious person thinking about health in the United States, you better try to answer. And if you care about these things for your children and grandchildren, if not yourself, you, you will have to try to address. And so this book, Me Versus Us, is really my trying to bring up the topics as to why it is that I don't have solutions. The solutions are complicated. I have small ideas, but we have to admit first that there's a problem. And I would say the problem is it's because we spend all this money on healthcare, which is clearly not taking our life expectancy longer and almost no money on public health. So I don't know if that's a long answer to your question, but there it is. Um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good answer. Um, and for those listening in, if you have questions, um, we will take questions happily and please put them in the QA box. Um, there are a few questions that were sent in advance when people registered, so I'm going to start reading those. Um, let's go from the bottom, from the bottom, okay. Um 300 people in the Miami Book Fair in a theater, 98% without masks. Do you wear a mask? What's your advice? Okay, so the person is saying, last night I, I attended an opening event in the Miami Book Fair. About 300 people were there, seated. 98% um, were without masks. <clears throat> so the question is, do you wear a mask in such circumstances? And what is your advice to others? So this is a, this is, this is a interesting question. Thank you. Um, I wish I could see you all and converse with you about this, but I know that we're not set up that way. So here's my answer. I am not currently an immunocompromised person. I am a person who is multiply vaccinated. And for those two reasons, I never wear a mask. I eat indoors. I go to meetings. I don't wear a mask. And, and that's not to say that I believe that I'm invincible. That's not to believe that unlike our host, I or like our host, I couldn't get COVID. Um, I'm a physician, I see people, I wear masks in medical settings because I'm asked to wear masks, but in my personal life, I don't wear a mask. Uh, would I rather eat outdoors than indoors when I could? Yes, I could. But I've decided that I don't really see an end point to um, to this uh, pandemic slash now endemic infectious disease. And really, since I was vaccinated with my booster, I have not worn a mask, except in, you know, very particular places. I try not to I try to wear a mask when I fly as much for other viruses as for COVID. And um, as I said, I try to eat outdoors, but I don't wear a mask because there will be a small chance that I could get infected. And um, there would then obviously be a small chance beyond that of getting long COVID. But um, since I don't feel that this is particularly lethal for me, given my status, uh, I expect to get infected over the years as I've gotten infected with many other viruses and uh, I don't ca choose to wear a mask everywhere. I, I don't think it's unreasonable if you're afraid or certainly if you're immunocompromised to wear a mask. I think it's fine. I think it will lower your risks. I believe in masks as a risk-lowering strategy, but uh, uh, I don't. And I don't see how a person really who's afraid of covid can ever now go without a mask so it's it's a it's a very difficult stance 
to hold, right? We're watching China do it as an entire country, uh, essentially. And it's it's hard to it's hard to imagine. So I, I choose not to. So that's my answer to that one. Okay, if anyone is interested, I always wore a mask and I still got it. So um, but you never know. Are there any nations, states, communities that do prioritize public health in a way that you feel is best? And what can we learn from these company these examples? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So well, I'll just put it, let's put it more generally to start with, right? Which is if you spend, as I point out in the book, eleven thousand dollars per American per year on health care and two hundred and eighty five dollars a year on public health, so forty times less per person on public health, you're gonna have crappy public health and probably pretty good medicine. And that's what we have, right? We have a good medical system. Like when I'm 80, there's no country I'd rather live in than here because, you know, my medical care system is better than any for people over 80. And that's still true, by the way, of the Europe numbers that I gave you, even with life expectancy worse in the United States. Once you get to 75 or 80, Americans do really well. <laughs> the problem is just getting to 75 or 80 in the United States. So I would say that in general, you know, the answer to prioritizing public health is to put money into public health, whether that means taking money away from healthcare, I'm fine with that. As a doctor, take let's take some money out of healthcare, that's good. If we want to spend different monies on public health, we should do that. But I think until our interest rises in public health, which in America, you only know there's interest when there's money. So assuming that there's money in conversation like this about public health, that's good. So beyond that, I think then it comes down to specific policies in specific countries. And there are lots of things that work in lots of places. In general, it's non-healthcare related things. Um, you know, in the United States, it's it's essentially about poverty mitigation. In other countries where there's less sort of polarization of the extremes in terms of wealth, then there are other social services. But in America, it's basically about poverty, as I see it. That's sort of the major driver of bad public health. Okay. Um... So I'm going to give the example of vaccines. So I have a cousin who lives in Arizona who refuses to get vaccinated. He says, I, you know, I believe in fate. And I said, well, do you go through red lights? <laughs> and he said, no, I don't go through red lights. I said, do you wear seatbelts? He said, of course I wear seatbelts. And I say, well, then <clears throat> those are public health measures. And um, I said, one reason you... you people stop at red lights is that they don't want to get killed, but they also don't want to kill other people, you know, <clears throat> by going through it. And we, we don't, we don't have the mentality, we don't have the mentality when it comes to um, a lot of public health measures that, you know, I'll get vaccinated to protect you as well as me. You know, so it is me versus us in, in that terms. It's very much V versus us in, in all of these vaccination terms. You know, we're not great, even before the COVID vaccine, which, you know, politicized things and made things worse. We, we've never been great at getting vaccinated. Um, you know, there's never been more than 50 or 60 percent of Americans who've gotten the flu vaccine. Uh, somewhere between 50 and 100,000 people die every year of flu. And yet we still don't get vaccinated at more than 50 or percent or so of the population. So there's something about vaccines that, are, that people have never liked. And then of course, at, at the moment, you know, we had, we, we had a, a, a president and really pretty much the data shows an entire party that decided that, you know, that, that vaccination is a sign of giving up your, you know, individual choice, giving up your liberty and therefore decided as a public statement to you know, put themselves at risk and to put others at risk. So now is an unusual moment. There are lots of people, lots of reasons why people haven't gotten vaccinated in the past. At the moment, it's 
particularly bad for for that reason. And of course, you know, it's it's a sad state. I say it with no glee. It's a sad state that, you know, really since the vaccine has been available since early 2021, you know, the continuing deaths in America are uh, disproportionately in Republican run locales in the United States. So this has really unfortunately become a sort of political death knell. And I'm not sure what there is to do about that. But, you know, the notion of sort of pro-sociality behavior is not really high. And, and, and of course, this spills over, as you said to your cousin, I don't know what he, his or her, you know, affiliation or background is, but you know, we also go into these things unaware, those who have children, right? The, there are more than a million unvaccinated children in America now who sit in schools often in some places, you know, and when your kid comes home with measles because there are unvaccinated kids in their school, that's not good for your kid or anybody in your family, but it's sort of unknown to you. So a lot of this is sort of going on you know, in lots of places. And I think it sort of gets down to, I mean, it's easy to sort of pick on vaccines at the moment, but it really is this idea that, that, you know, my behavior affects your behavior. And, and I don't know what it takes to buy that other than watching the news for a week and watching school shootings and thinking that, well, that's bad luck. You can sleep, eat, and exercise well. And your kid could be in a school and somebody with mental health issues comes in and shoots up the school or, you know, your aunt dies when she's hit in the car by a drunk driver. I mean, that's a, my health influences your health argument mm -hmm. a hundred thousand times every year in the United States. So, you know, again, it's, are, do we care about others? Well, not every minute of the day, but when you actually present people with, as you did, like you don't run red lights, I would say sort of the expansion of that is, well, you live in a world with, you know, people who are doing behaviors that you might not do, but that it could come to roost on you. And it's in, in your best interest to be interested in other people's um, issues. Here's a question. Having grown up in the United Kingdom, where public health and national health service was initiated post-World War II, it remains a mystery to me why the United States comes in at 11th, lagging behind every other developed na nation in all public health markers, life expectancy, infant mortality, women and children's health, and access to affordable care and hospitalization. <clears throat> Did the COVID pandemic change attitudes, improve qual quality, or modify the financial burdens or soften the humanitarian hardships that the US healthcare system inflicts on the entire population? That's a big, quite long, long question, but. Um... Yeah, I, you know, again, I don't like the word the US healthcare inflicts on the entire population. I think these are societal decisions. <laughs> By society, I mean their political decisions, and by political decisions, I mean it's by the people who you vote into office, who are making decisions about public health system investments, right? The healthcare system seems to sort of truck along on its own because there's four trillion dollars and there's lots of private money in it, and um, there's also you know a considerable amount of um, public money in it through Medicare and Medicaid, and um, seems to have no trouble moving along even when burdened by the COVID years. I think the, the public health system investments that you saw during COVID, I mean, the interesting part to me of COVID was the sort of the, the secret silver lining of the a million people dying in the United States, which is unbelievably sad and tragic and was partially avoidable, not wholly, but a bit avoidable is that you know with the money that went into covid relief through the cares act and arpa and other pandemic aid you know you had the largest reversal of poverty in the united states in the history of 
the last 50 years that money went into into lots of places that you know really changed child poverty in the united states which is of course another one of these horrendous statistics if we were spending time on that tonight you know that we're again the developed country with by far the highest child poverty rate and what you see is that you know by political will and by political money and by interest you can essentially eliminate child poverty which is <laughs> you know you it was reduced more than three quarters during the pandemic which is really remarkable and you can do that and so to me it's not the, it's 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 health public health system investments and whether we want to put in the money and it would take a lot of money and and just to go back i mean different places have spent some of this money in good ways doing good projects and um you know that that's important so i don't know if i answered that question fully david but there you go um yeah <laughs> i think so um there's one other question i want to get to um how could pu public health organizations like the cdc and the world health organization improve their abilities to communicate issues related to public health how can they do a better job of persuading the groups that fund them to do so in a way that would allow them to be more effective? Wow. So there's the funding question of CDC. And then there's sort of the communications issue. The communications issue is super interesting. I don't know that I have a great answer for it. I mean, what, what you saw during COVID was really you know, the, the new TV stars became these epidemiologists who would get on and talk on TV. You, you knew their names. They would talk all the time. And they didn't work for the CDC. We created a whole class of sort of media commentators who said things. And because we all either should have been or weren't enough humble about COVID and all the things we didn't know about it, including why David wears a mask every day and gets COVID, which is just evidence that we still don't quite get this in a way. Um, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of voices out there communicating to the public about public health. That is, in the United States at least, the CDC, which of course was hurt badly during the early months of the pandemic by Trump and um, didn't have its regular press conferences as it had with every other public health crisis in the past. It lost its voice during COVID. And, um, and I'm not sure even if it had its full voice, given how much cable news time was spent with epidemiologists all of whom had slightly different opinions and had slightly different mathematical <laughs> models I, it's hard to understand how you could have a single message like you did perhaps during polio and so i'm less sanguine about sort of single messages coming out at the moment but number one i would say yes it would have been better with for cdc to be our leading voice around infectious diseases, even if they don't always get it right. And B, you know, I wish we didn't have as much mis and disinformation penetrating our ears. That hurts the communication message. And number three, I would say that people who consider themselves experts should be a little more humble and a little quieter about what they think they know, because I felt that they were irresponsible in many cases during the pandemic. So I don't know that there's a perfect way anymore to communicate uh, public health messages, but uh, certainly a single or more unified voice when we know something very clearly is probably the best chance. And I don't know about funding. CDC's funding has gone up recently and that's probably good. And it probably needs to go up more because of the various data and infrastructure issues that need to be solved around public health in America. But, you know, CDC is not the voice of American public health, interestingly. <laughs> and um, it, that's not, <clears throat> it's taken that role over the years, but that's really not in its sort of mission statement. And even though there's great expertise at the CDC, um, 
it's a, it's a hard thing to achieve in the United States. Are there any nations, states, communities that do prioritize, prioritize public health in a way that you feel is best? So do we have a model of, of public health that in, um, you know, like we talk about Sweden or, or Denmark, places like that? Yeah, I mean, I think the places that have the longest life expectancy at the moment are probably the best of public health. That's That would be my metric. So uh, we could talk about the details of that, and I'm not expert at it, but places like Japan, very good. They're, you know, eight or nine years longer life expectancy than we have. Scandinavia, yes. You know, they tax at very high rates. They put a lot of money into their so social services from those taxes. Um, they have progressive policies. They don't have our legacy of racism and discrimination, which affect um, our health here. And they have, um, you know, again, longer life expectancies than we do. So I think there are complicated reasons and historic and cultural reasons why those places, which are also, as I would say, more pro-social, more trusting in government and trusting in expertise, smaller and therefore having more single voice communication, I think they did better during COVID and do better, did better before COVID, had longer life expectancy before COVID and did then did better during COVID in general than we did certainly during our first year. So within the also, United States- they, they also have a lot of great social pro programs in the elderly. Yeah, exactly. They, 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 they have a lot of interest in the elderly, which was one of our major at risk populations that was killed during COVID. And- you know, that was not as much the case in many places um, in Scandinavia, but, you know, they, they pay for it. They have put their money, right, for dollars sent, spent on health care. For every dollar spent on health care in Scandinavia, one dollar is spent on social service, social support. And that is very different from the United States, where it's 40 to one. So that's, that's I think, probably the underlying issue. Here's a question. Do, do you view the presentation of animal habitat as an important element of public health? Animal habitat? I'm not sure what that means. Um, I believe that there's surveillance. There should be surveillance of other countries where it's likely that many infectious diseases that are airborne begin. I think, yes, if that's what animal habitat mean specifically? Um, I think I can clarify that. Um, we've had a few shows about um, zootic spillover uh -huh. and that, you know, when we take lands away from other animals, they tend to interact more with humans uh -huh. and then causing pandemics. Right. So maybe that's it. Yeah. Here's, here's another question. P Pulitzer Prize recipient Lawrence Wright, Wright wrote a novel about a pandemic, the end yeah. of October, which was released just as the pandemic was starting proving that the de details of the pandemic are predictable. His current nonfiction book, The Year of the Plague, is a page turner about all the missed opportunities to lessen the impact of the pandemic. Have you read either book? And what do you think of his, his writing? I'm gonna have to say this. I've not read either of those books, I'm ashamed to say. Okay. I've read much of his journalism before those books, his books about Scientology. I've written a lot of what he said about Texas. He's fantastic. He's one of our great national treasure writers. I've read neither one of those uh, books because I feel like um, I read a lot about this stuff. So the, those are those are ones that I've missed. Okay, so I wanted to, um, as we get closer to the end, I wanted to ask you about um, <clears throat> How does a person go from thinking about themselves to us? I think they tune into your show like this. I mean, I think that I think that it's a hard transition. I think to me, to me, you know, I try to frame it as in, in as a legacy issue. That, that the things, that these things that have set back our life expectancy took a long time to get in place and will take a long time for a slow reversal. And that if the notion is you wanna leave a better place 
for your children and grandchildren. To me, that's the persuasive argument. And I think people care about that. I think I think that is the argument for those who are interested in sort of the greatest public health issue of them all, which is climate change. That has to be your reason for being interested, right? Because mm -hmm. who or I may have some effect of climate change with fires and hurricanes and floods, but it's about to get much worse if things don't change. There's very different from any other public health matter because this is a existential threat across the globe and because there's a clock on it that is every time minute we don't think about it, things are going to get worse. And of course, you know, public health people can tell you all the reasons why climate change in the short run make things worse from, as we said, greater zoonotic, more Lyme disease, more heat deaths. You know, there are acute problems that start to happen in addition to all of the things you read about in the news. But to, to me, the persuasive issue across people is really about legacy and that public health is a legacy issue. I also just see it as sort of a public good that is, we don't typically go along and say, I want to get rid of all fire departments. We sort of have a understanding in our social compact that we like fire departments, that if you got rid of all fire departments, there would still be fires. It's just that the fires would be much worse. And as we underfund public health, we're underfunding the taking care of a public good the fires of public health are still there. They're just going to get worse if you don't spend your time on public health. Now, in the background, you're doing other things. You're making fire-resistant wood, and you're building differently, and you're having fire-resistant wire. Right? There's prevention that happens for fire, but we still need a fire department, just as there's prevention happening, vaccines, et cetera, but you still need a public health department. So to my mind, if you want to get rid of fire departments, you should have no interest in public health. If you like fire departments, I hope that you would think of public health as a common good like that. And that's a reason to protect it. So fire departments and your children are the reasons, are the way you can convert your thinking from me to us. So early on during the pandemic at seven o'clock at night in New York City, people you know, took to their windows and applauded the healthcare workers who were taking care of people. Yeah. Um, Dr. Fauci was a hero. There was even a bobblehead. Um, and that has changed. I mean, seven o'clock, there's nothing going on. And um, and um, Dr. Fauci has death threats. So what, what makes, you know, what do you think accounts for that? You know? I think we have short memories. I mean, you know, yeah. we just had, you know, Hurricane Ian wiping out parts of Florida and we've had Hurricane Katrina and you know part of the population who suffered acutely will think about Ian and Hurricane Katrina forever and the rest of the population moves on I mean we have a short attention span in all matters including health matters and these sort of spikes that kill many people and make the news again is sort of a tiny part of public health but the public health has to do with sort of sustained attention to things which is a, another reason why we have trouble with in the united states we don't do sustained attention so well we have you know polar opposite political parties now that take different stands on a variety of public health issues and by public health issues, I consider everything from taxes to earned income tax credit to SNAP programs for poverty, et cetera, all of which bear on the health of the population. If you're swinging back and forth on those, again, you don't have sustained attention and it's problematic. So, yeah, that, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, why don't you show a copy of the book again and tell people where they can be? Thank you. Please order the book. Tell your friends. Tweet about it. Write about it. Write me a letter. My website is michaelsteinbooks.com. 
you can see all my books there and you can write to me through there i would love to interact with anybody listening and i'm happy to come talk about this subject again and again it's a conversation that is i think important and really the start to admitting that some changes would help and um i really appreciate people tuning in and spending time and particularly you david is feeling crappy and coming on so thank you oh you're welcome um and on November 22nd, which is next um, Tuesday, we're going to be discussing um, the, the person. Uh, I'll be talking with New York Times reporter Apurva Mandavelli, who had to cancel last week because she was sick. And she's going to be talking about the a triple pandemic this winter. And she will discuss her experiences reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic, monkeypox, and RSV, which is respiratory since situ virus um which is she's the great virus. she's great tune in she is great and um rss is as um you know really um 78 of our children's hospitals are filled with rs children with rss so i hope you will tune in she's been my guest before and she was really great and and tons of questions and um, Dr. Stein, you were great. And uh, again, um, this will be on YouTube for people who can watch it. I, I think we have one more question. Let me just see. We vaccines, which of course it's political. There are a lot of people who fear vaccine side effects more than they fear COVID itself, based in part on an inability to interpret statistics. To what extent do you think better statistical and science literacy might improve the public health education? I think better citizenship, civic civics courses coming back. I think we, we almost teach civics in public health schools now because people don't understand how the government works, how long it takes to make policies. Um, certainly we're innumerate as a country. We do better understanding numbers. The numbers here, however, were very clear. Maybe the presentation of the numbers wasn't clear, but when you have a vaccine that's as effective as the vaccines we've had and you're not taking it, you must have certain very particular reasons for not taking those vaccines. There's no statistics, advanced statistics that was needed from this. You don't die typically of side effects from vaccines, but you do die of COVID. And that seemed like a straight up message for people and statistics would not have overcome people's hesitancy in this case. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Stein, and thank you, everyone, for listening in, and um, <clears throat> if you join us next week, I hope you will, um, and I want to wish everyone else out there to be um, safe and take the reasonable precautions they can, and also think about public health and think about others. Happy okay. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Good night. <laughs>